we're on. So let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you for this morning and for the chance to be together. And we pray that you would continue to be with us on this, um, on this new Sunday morning. We ask that you would open the eyes of our heart as we uh, continue on in the book of Romans. Give us your peace and give us your wisdom. Hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. We're going to hopefully today finish up the salutation. If I say, if you write a letter, see, all of you are old enough to remember writing letters before email or social media. And when you went to school, they taught us how to write letters and you always begin, begin with a salutation. And it's English, it's very brief, it's dear so-and-so. But here in Paul's letters, they always open up with a salutation. That's, if you remember all the way back to our study of 1 John, it's one of the reasons there's a lot of skepticism as to whether 1 John is a letter at all, because there's no salutation. But here, we definitely have a salutation. And if you look at the various sheets that I gave you last time, you can see that, especially Eugene Peterson's, um, let's see, one to seven, Eugene Peterson's translation, Eugene Peterson basically takes verse one and verse seven and puts them together and begins, I, Paul, a devoted slave of Christ Jesus on assignment, authorized as an apostle to proclaim God's words and acts. I write this letter to all believers in Rome, God's friends. And again, if you look at the text from your Bible or one of the other um, translations that are closer, you'll notice that Paul has basically taken verses two through six and put them below and has verse one through seven up above. So what I did this week was I, let's see, maybe, okay, I'm still, what I did this week was I made a diagram of sorts. Now this is not technically, maybe when you were in grade school too, you learned how to diagram sentences. And this isn't really technically a diagram of the sentence structure because to do this in Paul's Greek sentences, requires a lot. So I just made sort of a diagram that helps us understand how the sentence flows. The main part of the sentence, as Eugene Peterson had, begins right at the top. It's a very simple sentence. Paul, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And that's really the heart of the sentence. And almost everything else in those subsequent verses are explanations of a first of a few specific words, words that will need explaining. And when we get into the Thanksgiving portion and the prayer portion, you will notice that, well, this is, Paul is going to continue to try to explain to us his relationship with the Romans. And that's, we're going to have to talk more about that. So the main sentence, I can, the main sentence is really right here, this section right here. Paul, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ to all those in Rome and of Rome then who are loved by God and called to be saints. Everything going good, Raj? We got a little adjustment from Rick? Okay. Good. Good. You can still hear me, Rick? Okay, good. So, that's the main sentence, and that's the salutation, and that's how it works. But Paul is going to do a little bit of explaining about himself here. So, um, see some of this stuff, part of the reason I wanted to move to computer is not only because we can better represent this 
out on the screen to those who are watching, but also it's even easier to erase and mark on a computer than it is on a whiteboard. Okay, so Paul, and Paul is going to say three things about himself. A slave of Jesus of Christ Jesus, we talked about that last week, called to be an apostle, and we talked about that a little bit last week. What is an apostle? One who is sent. Paul is called to be an apostle, one who is sent out. And so he's a slave, called to be an apostle, and set apart for the gospel of God. Now, the gospel word is what's going to get a lot of attention here because we're going to talk about that more. And in the previous lessons, we talked about that with respect to the Roman Empire, right? This is what we called a loan word. What do you remember was a loan word? I, I, may, I mentioned a bunch of loan words in English that we use. Okay, so taco is a loan word. Burrito is a loan word. All these words that were taken from another language into ours. Good news is from, again, the Roman Empire, where there was a message of victory, deliverance, something which would have huge public ramifications, but as we talked about before, Maybe you lived in a city and your city wasn't directly affected by the war, but you knew if your nation lost the war, your city eventually would be impacted by the war. So a messenger would come with good news. A messenger would come with gospel. So before that was a Christian word, it was a word, it was a political word used to talk about some deliverance, news from afar. And so Paul's going to talk about Gospel. So Paul, a slave, an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Okay. So in that way, God is sort of differentiated from Caesar. Okay. What about this gospel? Gospel which he promised previously. So who is the he? God. Okay. That's a long discussion about whether, so the old standard was whenever you would use the pronoun that referred to God, you would capitalize it. And about 30, 40 years ago, a bunch of people came around and said, no, we shouldn't do that. So sometimes you'll see it capitalized and sometimes you won't see it capitalized. I prefer it capitalized just because it's clearer than your you know, one could make the argument that it's not capitalized in Greek. Why isn't it capitalized in Greek? They used no capitalizations at all in Greek. They didn't even use word spacing. So in other words, it was letters, a string of letters. You had to figure out what it meant. And before, I've, I've done a little exercise where, maybe I'll do it again sometime, where if I type a string of letters in English all next to each other, you guys can read it pretty well because you're so accustomed to splitting up the words in your mind. But the Greek text was all letters, so they didn't use capitalization. They did have large, they did have sort of capitalized script and lowercase script but they would just use one in a document. They didn't use it to differentiate in all the ways that we do. We have the beginning of the sentence has a capitalization and the end of the sentence has a period. There's none of that in any of the Greek text. And so the word spacing is something we add to it. Capitalization is something we add to it. And so we notice that in our text, but of course there was none of that in the Greek text. So, Paul set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised previously through his prophets, and again, his, go to God, through his prophets in 
Where are these promises from? The Holy Scriptures. Any questions on any of that? You might say, well, where did he promise the gospel? Well, what are, what specific scriptures is Paul speaking about here? Is he talking about the New Testament gospels? Isaiah, the prophetic books. And obviously what we have and what we call the New Testament was being written at this time, and so they didn't have it. This letter would become part of the New Testament, but the, the, the Holy Scriptures for the early church were the Old Testament, and they read those believing that Jesus was foretold in them and was speaking through, God was speaking through them to the church about this good news. Now, what's really important there is that should help us think about, okay, what was the referent to these good news? We've talked a lot about Israel, but now Paul, again, is applying it to Rome and the Romans. Any question on this section? Okay, so gospel, which he promised previously through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, gospel concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, so you see gospel has one, two segments from that. You'll notice Paul had three. One, two, three. Gospel, two subordinate clauses with respect to it. This is how we get such long sentences. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, who now we're going to basically have the same thing happen with Jesus where he's going to say a couple of things about Jesus. Jesus, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared Son of God in power according to the Holy Spirit. So one, two, and then there'll be more subordination after that. Um, now, if I say the word Christology, what do you think of? Teachings of Christ. Okay. If I say the word astrology, what do you think of? If I say astronomy, what's the difference between astrology and astronomy? Okay, that's actually a pretty good way to get into this. Astrology Astronomy. You'll notice Astro. So Astro is not just the name of the Jetsons dog. Um, astrology, astronomy. Both are talking about astro, the, the heavens, the skies. Okay. Astrology is the logos of the skies. Astronomy is the nomos of the skies. Probably for you, logos is a more familiar word than nomos. If I were to have to render those in English, nomos would mean law. So when someone is saying they're studying astronomy, what are they studying? The laws of the stars. Now, if Elon Musk wants to send a group of people to the moon, does he want people who have studied astrology or astronomy? 
Astronomy. Why? Okay. That's in that whole world. They're talking about the laws of the stars, the routines. They want to know exactly where Mars will be at a certain place in time so that they can launch their ship from Earth to Mars. And they want Mars to be there when the ship gets there. <laughs> that's what they're really considered. That's what they're really concerned about. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, you've got astrologers to help you, Elon Musk, get your people to Mars. So when we say astrology in our culture, what do we mean? Okay. What the stars are telling us. All right. Now, let's... Christology. It's the logos of Christ. That's what Christology is. All right. Um, so let's let's ask about Christology. Handwriting. Chris. Christology. Christology is the logos of Christ. Now, if you look at the text, we have two things about Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, his son, all the way again, back up to God. His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh. What does that mean? He was a descendant of David according to the flesh. His bloodline. See if this switches. Good, it does. So Christology says Jesus is human. Is Jesus half human? Fully human, Christology says. Jesus is fully human. Okay. Now, if we go back to the text, so who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared Son of God in power according to the Holy Spirit. Well, that sounds interesting. He's not only God, he's not only son of David, according to the flesh, he is declared son of God, according to the Holy Spirit. And so no, notice the parallelisms in how these sentences are put together. One of the things that this diagram helps show is that when we look at these paragraphs in English and we sort of read through them serially, it's kind of one thing after another, and it's easy to sort of get lost in them. But if you slow it down and you take it apart, you begin to see that there's a structure about this, and Paul wants to emphasize a number of things. Paul is three things. He's a slave, he's an apostle, and he's set apart by the gospel of God. And then he's going to say two things about the gospel. The gospel, which God promised previously through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, set apart to the gospel concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, what about his son, God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord? He was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, and he was declared son of God in power according to the Holy Spirit. And you might say, when did that happen, and how did the Holy Spirit declare Jesus as God's Son? Now, there are actually a number of times that you could point to. The one that Paul mentions here, by the resurrection of the dead. 
Now, where would be another time that God declared Jesus to be his son? His baptism. When, do you remember what happened at the baptism? Jesus comes out of the water and what? The dove descends down and there's a voice from heaven. So he's declared there too. Why would Paul mention specifically the resurrection from the dead? And how does that, okay, how is that a declaration of Jesus as God's son by the Holy Spirit? So here's a question. There's almost always two ways to look at things. From above and from below. From below, how did the first per people to meet Jesus meet Jesus? What did they see? A baby, a boy, a man, walking around, teaching, talking. When Jesus talked, did everyone just stop and say, oh, surely he must be the son of God? Some people were very impressed and decided to follow him, but they were a small group of people. He tended to get a lot of other people pretty angry. There were times when the crowd wanted to make Jesus king and times when the crowd wanted to kill Jesus. Now, that alone is a very interesting tidbit of information because most of us, we're not in any danger of anybody trying to make us king and we're not in any danger of anybody trying to kill us. And that's a good thing. But Jesus was very remarkable. And so what happened was the, the word on Jesus, on who he was, was very much divided among who is Jesus. And then Jesus, well, even his disciples, his disciples had a number of experiences with Jesus that they didn't quite know what to do with. Jesus stills the storm, and his disciples are terrified. And the Greek is ambiguous as to, well, we knew they were terrified about the storm. And when Jesus stilled the storm, they were more terrified still. Why? They saw his power. The storm was frightening because of the power of the storm, which they under understood as fishermen. They understood that the storm could take their lives. But now Jesus' power is greater than the power of the storm. That will really twist your mind. But what we see with the disciples is that they encounter Jesus, they encounter his power, and emotionally they're all over the map. Sometimes they're terrified of him. Sometimes they're pleased with him. Sometimes they're confused by him. Now, Jesus tells them on their way down to Galilee, we're going down to Galilee, we're going down to Judea. I'm going to be turned over to the hands of Gentiles. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to come back from the dead. And yet on Easter Sunday morning, how many of his disciples were at the tomb waiting for him to emerge from the tomb? Zero. The women came, why? To anoint his body, to do the dirty work. And they were concerned because none of the men, you know, you'd think, you, we, we know that they were anxious about the stone when they were making their way to the tomb because they didn't know how to move it. And you'd think they'd say, come on, guys, you guys followed him. Come with us to the tomb so you can help us move the stone so we can anoint his body. No, all the men stay back. And the women go. And then, of course, the stone is rolled away, and the word from the angel, he is not here, he is, he is risen, and then suddenly you start having the appearances of Jesus to his disciples, and they don't know what to do. Okay. They are calling him the Son of God. Why? What does that term mean?
chosen by God to teach his ways. Yes. We could also say that of prophets. If you were a monarch, well, we just kind of had a monarchy in the States for a little while. Um, if you were the president of the United States and you wanted to emphasize, see, this is where things get tricky. If you want to emphasize the position of the government of the United States, you send an ambassador, you send the secretary of state. And in a monarchy, the king can send an ambassador. The king might have someone who is functioning as a secretary of state. But if the king really wanted to make an emphasis, who would the king send? His son. Well, himself, yes. But also his son. Why? He's next in line. So if you're the king of another empire and an ambassador comes over, oh, that's good. You've got some sense of official communication. But if the son comes over, and says, I'm speaking for my father, the king also is a little bit more excited because he knows at some point, the father's going to die. And then, who am I going to have to deal with? The son. So why don't I take this opportunity to establish a relationship with the son so that when the son comes into his inheritance, my relationship with that kingdom will be even more solid than before. One of the things that you'll often see with celebrities is that there's a different there's a different there's a different there's a different class between the before and the after. Before someone was a celebrity, they had all their friends. Before they were a celebrity or before they won the lottery or before they inherited the kingdom, all of their friends were their friends based on what? Their personal relationships, whether they liked them or not. They would tell them the truth. None of the status that comes after impacted the friendships before. Now, after someone wins the lottery, after someone puts out, after someone goes on a reality TV show and gets a big Instagram following, after someone is, is thrust or finds their way into the public light, then you have all of these people that want to be friends, right? What's with the quality of those friendships? Ah, the person at the center is never quite sure. Do they love me or do they love the opportunities that I present for them? So this is why get to know the king's son before he's the king. Because will the king's son become the king? Well, you never quite know. You know, there might be a coup. Uh, the son might die. And so in the ancient world, when you sent your son, that was a really big deal. So Jesus was declared son of God in power, according to the Holy Spirit, by the resurrection of the dead. Yes. And it was a very big deal. So Caesar, um, Julius Caesar, sort of the original Caesar, although at the time they played all these games that they didn't really want to call them king because there was a long tradition in Rome, an anti-monarchical tradition in Rome where once someone became king, everyone was nervous about them because they didn't want an autocrat. So after Julius Caesar was killed, he was declared to be divine. What did that mean? Why not? Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. So you have a moral objection to Julius Caesar's divinity. Yes. And that's very reasonable. Because if I were to tell you more about Julius Caesar, I would only intensify your moral objection to Julius Caesar. In his, he wrote a book, which was really mostly a propaganda piece. Um, he wrote an autobiography where he describes his conquest of the Gauls. Who are the Gauls? France. It's pretty much north of what today we call Italy. So he wrote this biography about his conquest of the Gauls. And basically in there, he brags about killing a million people and brags about enslaving another million people. Now today, that wouldn't wash. Why? We have moral objections. Um, so gods of the ancient world, you've got Julius Caesar. Let's see how well I spell. You've got um, Alexander. And instead of a last name, we have the great. You've got Cyrus. Well, was Cyrus declared a god? I don't know. Uh, you had pharaohs. Why would these people be declared gods? Their power, their effectiveness. They ruled the earth like a god. Ah. See, now, when Carol raises her objection to the divinity of Julius Caesar, it's because a different son of God fundamentally changed, in Carol's word, the definition of morality. Julius Caesar can't be a god because he's immoral. I also have been talking at the services about the differences between paganism and it was started by the Jews, the Christians continued it, Islam continues it, and sometimes we'll say monotheism. And that sort of gets at it, monotheism as opposed to polytheism. What do we understand that to mean? One God versus many gods. But in a lot of ways, the big difference between paganism and this is what gods are. Because so I've mentioned before this Jewish scholar that in the 1930s, towards the beginning of the 20th century, he was reading all this ancient mythology, and he was reading, he obviously was an expert in the Bible, and he said, there's some things missing from the Bible that everyone else in the ancient world would expect to find. One of those things is the story of the birth of the gods. In the Bible, there's no story of the birth of the gods. You have a story of the creation of the world, but God is there right at the start. There's no story of the birth of the gods. What he began to talk about was that the question, although there's certainly a question of number, the big difference between all the other world religions, now paganism is a much older, is a much newer thing. So let's just talk about the world. The difference between the world and the Jews was that in the world, there was this thing called, that he called in the 1930s, the meta 
divine realm. Okay. And within the meta divine realm, there are things called gods. And that might be Zeus. It might be Achilles. Or Achilles would then be a demigod. Anybody know what a demigod is? What's the difference between a demigod and a god? Not quite there. They'd have one. Well, gods had many faults. If you read Greek mythology, it's easy for the humans to see the faults of the gods. But usually a demigod was part human and part God. See, now when we get to talking about Jesus, and, and you still see this if you go to a place like India and you ask people about Jesus, who will they say Jesus is? He's kind of a demigod. Right. Now, before, when I asked you about Christology, what did we say about Jesus? And fully God. That's very much a function of the difference between these worlds. And I've got all these things. Oh, here we go. Um, that's very much a function of the difference between these worlds because the world pretty much posited that the world as sort of an arena is impersonal. Reality is just a blank canvas, and within that arena, there are agents. Now, if you look for a travel agent, what are you looking for? Someone who will plan your trip. They are an actor. They operate within the arena of the travel industry. They themselves are not the travel industry, but they are merely an agent within the arena of the travel industry. This Jewish scholar, Ezekiel Kaufman, in comparing mythology to the Bible, noted that the Jews conceptualized their God as something fundamentally different. Paul expresses this in the, um, in the book of Acts. Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. Hmm. What does that mean? See, for the Jews, God is both arena and, in some ways, agent. When we look at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are agents. They act. They speak. They have intentionality. They have desires. But there is no separate arena outside of God in which God acts. Why is that important? So if you are a travel agent, you call your travel agent and say, I want to get from Sacramento to LaGuardia, New York on Tuesday, December 5, and I want to arrive by 10 a.m. Uh, why? Uh, time and space. The travel agent and, in fact, the travel industry are subservient to time and space in order to achieve what an agent wishes to achieve. Okay. Kaufman notes, once you have a meta-divine realm, the gods within the meta-divine realm are subject to the limitations of the laws of the meta-divine realm. In other words, all of these other gods are smaller than the Hebrew god. 
the Hebrew God is quite literally author of creation. Now, we are within this creation, but there is no creation outside of which God must bend his will towards. Like the travel agent, well, travel agent might say, well, in order to get there by 10 a.m., you could get to you could get to New York by 10 a.m. The flight would probably have to leave at maybe, you know, four in the morning, five in the morning, let's say. Well, why aren't there any five flights leaving from Sacramento to New York City at five in the morning? It's not impossible. You could have a plane and a pilot. You could do all of that. Why aren't there any flights, direct flights from Sacramento from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. New York? Why, why, why not? Why? Ah, so I could find a plane, a charter flight, and a pilot, and I could pay all of that money to have someone fly me there. But the travel agent is going to say the travel agent is not only subservient to time and space, the travel agent is also subservient to the marketplace. And whereas I could fly the night before, I've got to fly with a whole group of other people who are willing to pool their money in this whole system. And that's the point. The gods of the pagan world are subservient to the systems in their world. The Hebrew God is the author of all systems. It's a categorical difference. And this is what makes this claim and the ideas of the Hebrews so astounding. And this is why the Christology of Christianity is so different. Now, why are Jesus' miracles about stilling a storm so dramatic? How can Jesus still a storm? Right. He is in place of the meta-divine realm. If he wants the storm to stop, he tells it to stop. And it stops. He's not subject to the storm. Okay. Now, the resurrection. We know he's the son of God. What else isn't he subject to? He's not subject to death. You see, underneath what's going on here with Paul and the ancient pagan world is he's not just trying to shift them to a better God. Jesus certainly is a better God, but he is trying to shift them to a completely different understanding of what the world is. Now, I didn't come across this idea about the metadivine realm until a year and a half or two years ago. But I had all of these ideas which basically said similar things so that when I heard about the metadivine realm, I said, oh, oh, okay. Well, that makes sense now. What is the difference between God, the God of Israel, and Zeus? Zeus is subject to the metadivine realm. The God of Israel is agent and arena both. This is a shocking difference. All right. So, the Son of God, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Now, something interesting is happening there. All right, Fred. No problem. Okay. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Now remember, Paul begins by saying he is called to be an apostle. What's he saying of the Roman church? They've received grace and...
they're called to be sent. Now, when we get into the next section, which we're not obviously not going to get into today, um, this is part of the reason Rome is so important. I was reading Origen's commentary on the Romans. Origen is a very ancient thinker who, one of the first commentaries in the book of Roman, we can find from Origen. And one of the questions we're going to have to ask is, when he writes to Thessalonica, he's got all these personal things. He's never been to Rome. He's writing to Rome. What's so special about Rome? <laughs> it's the capital of civilization. It's the center of the world. It's going to be a big deal why Paul goes, why Paul writes this letter. Okay, so we're out of time. So let's pray. And next week we'll finish this off and we will get into the next section, which is first you have the salutation, then you have the thanksgiving, then you have the prayer. And then with Paul, we're going to get into everything that Paul wants to say. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this letter to the Romans and that you moved Paul to write it. Because Lord, he, like all of us, was busy with life and this and that, and his view of the future was quite limited. But what we have then in this letter to a place Paul never visited, a place considered to be the center of the world, is one of the definitive articulations of Christianity that the world has known. And so, Lord, as we go through this book, we pray that you would continue to give us opportunities to look at what all of this means, why all of this matters, how this changes our lives completely. So, Lord, give us your spirit and give us your wisdom. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.